If you want to become a better formulator in 2022, this video is for you. Hey bees, I'm Marie from Hubble Bee and Me, and as we welcome 2022, I wanted to share six New Year's resolutions for formulators that will help you level up your formulating skills. These are lessons that I've learned over the years that have taught me so much, and I wanted to share them with you. I'm confident that if you choose even two of these resolutions and incorporate them into your workflow throughout 2022, you will notice a huge difference. Resolution number one is to try your ideas and to be okay with them failing. One of the biggest types of questions I get both here on YouTube and over on the blog is people asking if they can make a change to a formulation and if that change will work. And I really want to encourage you to just try it and find out for yourself. Once you get into the habit of trying things for yourself, it will really increase your confidence and you'll find there is no better way to learn than really doing it and seeing how it turns out and experiencing that end result firsthand. If you're not sure where to start, I recommend heading over to humblebeeandme.com, choosing a formulation that you are comfortable with, that you've maybe made once or twice before, and then scrolling down and checking out the substitutions list. For every formulation I've shared for I think the past three issues, there's a list of substitution suggestions right at the bottom of the formulation. So try making one of those suggested substitutions and then see, you know, take the, the substituted, updated new version and compare it to the version that you made the first time and see what happens. You can also look up ingredients in the Humble Bee and Me encyclopedia because every entry in the Humble Bee and Me encyclopedia includes substitution suggestions for that ingredient. Do some research on the original ingredient and the ingredient that you are you know, making the swap for and form a hypothesis about how that change might impact the final formulation and then make it and see if your hypothesis was correct. Get your own personal feel for how stearic acid differs from cetyl alcohol in a lotion or for how apricot kernel oil impacts your lotion if you choose it over say sweet almond oil. Do you notice a change? What is the change? What do you think? Just try it yourself. Another part of the formulation that you can experiment with is the process. Perhaps you're looking at the ingredient list for a formulation and you're wondering why one water soluble ingredient is in the oil phase. Try it both ways and see if you notice a difference. Is having it in the oil phase a little bit nicer? Is it a huge pain in the backside if it ends up in the water phase first? Try it and see. You might find that the as written way has some logic behind it or you might find that it's just that particular formulators kind of I've always done it that way and then you tried it a different way and you've learned something new and awesome. Resolution number two is to try things that you have been told or read or think can't or won't work. Start small to reduce waste and set out to see for yourself. Now you're probably going to make some stuff that is pretty darn bad, but remember there's a lot of room under the umbrella of bad. What kind of bad is it? Is it say too hard for a body butter, but it could make an amazing lip balm? Is it too greasy for a body butter, but perhaps could make an amazing massage product? Think out of the box about your perceived failures. What is it that you don't like about it? And where in what type of product could that characteristic be a feature rather than a flaw. If what you made really is unusably awful, it's a complete failure, figure out what happened so that you can recognize that mistake or failure when it happens in the future. Sometimes you'll learn that a don't do that is more rooted in personal preference than a hard formulation failure. Maybe you'll agree with the person that said don't do that, but maybe you won't. I know I was initially quite wary of using large amounts of vegetable glycerin in leave-on formulations because I had read that it would make things way too sticky, just unusable, unpleasant. And then one day I decided to give it a try and I made a formulation based on a La Roche-Posay product that contained 30% vegetable glycerin and I ended up loving it. When I shared that formulation, I ended up getting quite a lot of pushback from other people who had read that that much glycerin couldn't possibly work. And really all I could say to them was give it a try. If you have been dismissing this avenue of formulation forever based on just some something that you have read, but you haven't tried it, try it. You could be very pleasantly surprised, or you could learn that you really don't like that much glycerin in your product, and now you know that you've got you know, a hard upper line. But either way, you'll learn something. One of the boundaries that I have been enjoying playing with in this realm is preservation, trying new preservatives, and especially more natural ones. I used to immediately write off a lot of formulation ideas and ingredients I wanted to include in things because I just immediately was like, well, that won't work, and I would never be able to preserve that, and that will never be shelf stable. But in recent years, I have been trying 
trying a lot of those things that past me thought wouldn't work, and I'm finding I'm very pleasantly surprised. A lot of them really are turning out to be beautifully stable, and it's opening up you know, so many new things for me to experiment and play with, and it's really exciting. I am so glad that I took the time to try some things that I thought wouldn't work, because it turns out I was wrong. Resolution number three is a bit of a two-parter. It's stop trying to find hard answers to soft questions. The first part of this is learning to recognize a soft question. A soft question is a big, squishy question that in order to answer in any way adequately would require a lot of follow-up questions to narrow it down. A non-formulation example of a big soft question is What's the best car? Well, where do you live? What's the weather like there? What are you using the car for? What is your budget? Are you planning on you know, regularly driving around large groups of people or is it just you and your trusty canine sidekick? Trying to find hard answers to soft questions will drive you nuts and will really make your research very hard because you'll be looking for a nice little succinct answer when there just isn't one. Learn to recognize soft questions and become okay with the answer being, it depends. I honestly think it's a good approach to just expect the answer to a lot of questions to be, it depends, and then allow that it depends-ness to guide you towards asking more precise questions so that you can get a more precise answer. Some common soft questions that I get asked are things like, how much essential oil can I use? What is the best preservative? How much emulsifier do I need? All of these questions will require a lot more follow-up questions in order to be able to offer anything resembling a actionable answer. Please make sure you are reading the partner blog post for more details. I've got them all written out. I just thought it would be probably not all that fun to listen to me run through those. <laughs> Resolution number four is to be curious and research, research, research. I honestly believe that researching your ingredients is a bit of a low key superpower. Back at the beginning of 2020, I shared a two part blog post on how to research your ingredients, the information that you should be looking for, and a lot of places where you can find it. The more information that you gather about how different ingredients work and why they're used, it just, oh, you'll be reading the ingredient list, of something at the drugstore, and have this wonderful kind of mental fireworks moment as you realize, you know, why this is there and why they've done that and what's going on here. And oh, gives me the happy shivers just thinking about it. In addition to researching your ingredients, go out and find formulations from suppliers or manufacturers and from other makers who share them and look at them and try to figure out what is going on. Analyze them. How big is each phase? How much of each ingredient did they use? Look at ingredient and phase ratio. So how much emulsifier are they using in relation to the oil phase size? Are any of those ratios or usage levels really different from what you've done in the past? Could that possibly be a thing for you to experiment with in the future. Which preservative did they use? Is there a listed target pH? What's emulsifying it? What's stabilizing it? Why and how does this formulation work? Think of it perhaps like a Rube Goldberg machine where you're trying to understand what every little teeter-totter, what every lever and what every gear in the machine does. Wondering why something was done in a particular way? Research it, think about it, and try it and see if it had to be done that way or if that's just the way that it was written, just the way that formulator likes to do that thing. Are you pretty confident that a different method could work? Try it and see. I also really recommend reading all sorts of things that you're not really sure will ever be useful for you because you never know when a little fact will kind of float to the surface of your mind when you're kind of wrestling with some other problem somewhere and that little fact is just like, hey, Now's my moment. Resolution number five is to let things percolate. Many of my best formulations and biggest formulation breakthroughs have come from stepping away from something and giving myself a bit of distance and space to just sort of let things percolate. Work on something until you stop making progress and then set it aside. Continue to create, learn, and research working on other things. And then one day inspiration will strike and you will be working on something completely unrelated and your brain will go, hey, the thing we're doing here, we should try it over there on that shelved project. That is such a, just such an awesome feeling when, you know, sort of through space and time, 
you have a brainwave and, and it connects. And resolution number six is to extend your timelines, to give yourself more time than you think you need to work on things, projects, formulations, whenever possible. I can't tell you how many times I've been working on a formulation with a plan to share it with you guys on a certain day and it just hasn't got there yet. And so I just swap out something different to go out that day and I give myself more time to work on that formulation because I would way rather do that and release it later than release it earlier and have it not be good, not be worth your time and ingredients. Of course, not all deadlines are self-imposed and you won't always have the option to extend all your deadlines, but wherever you can, try to give yourself more time than you think you'll need to work on things. You'll almost always be glad that you had it. And those are the six New Year's resolutions that I recommend for formulators to really help you level up your formulating game. Have you made any New Year's resolutions for your formulating this year? What resolutions would you love to sort of go back in time and suggest to your younger formulating self. I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Please check out the partner blog post for additional links and resources. And as always, I will see you later.